Hello, good evening. Welcome to this edition of Good Evening Ghana. Now, today's program is a program that you shouldn't think about missing. You, you, can't, you can't miss it. The kind of stuff we have for you today is just totally amazing. So, uh, our main conversation tonight is about LGBTQ plus I, etc. Now, if you look at our, our, our flyer, we are asking fundamental questions of one of the promoters of the bill tonight. We are asking whether the prohibition of LGBT, the deliberate prohibition of LGBT in Ghana, which is the attempt that the promoters of the bill are seeking to establish, um, will that uh, create some uh, hate concerns, as has already started on international Twitter, some of you have seen it, will that create some hate concerns for the Ghanaian establishment and Ghanaian democracy? And the other question we are asking is that, um, will, will that those circumstances sort of render Ghana into a pariah state. You've heard um, even one of the, the big Christian advocates, the Medina MP, the Honorable Sosu, raised concerns about, about this pariah state issue. We have also heard uh, MPP stalwarts Gabi Ochidako raise concerns about this pariah state issue. And so we're going to deal with all of that. And then we have an interesting history, you know, that on this program we always like to differentiate. We have dig deep and found the history of where all of this is coming from. The, the first examples of colonial uh, handover of rules and regulations and laws and it will amaze you that the prohibition of homosexuality was actually handed to us from england as well as it being part of our culture but there is a record that it was handed to us from england myself and um, our legal researcher will be on the touch screen to show you the history and guess who is our guest tonight uh, sam nati george he calls himself sam nati jata george he is the member of parliament for ningo pram pram and he is one of the main movers of the bill. He is here in the studio. That's, that's part one. The other part is um, the uh, Chief Justice matter. So tonight we have gone into the court and looked at the entire process. This is the case in which uh, Christian Frifa, a barrister, is alleging against the learned Chief Justice that he had demanded bribe from his client, etc., etc. You know the story. We'll tell you the story. We have put together um, an editorial, very, very um, a detailed editorial with all the court processes about the case and then we will uh, give you the conclusions so you can make the judgment for yourself. We decided to do that because we think that this matter against the Chief Justice who ought to represent the fountain of justice in our country and under the Constitution is a matter of grave public importance. So that's, that's the first thing we'll do tonight though before we get to the main story. Uh, so that, that's it. That's, uh, that's the big story tonight. Uh, you cannot miss this. Let's just take our break and clear the break from there so that when we get on the highway, we are fully on the highway. Our uh, interactive bit will be on. Our young people are in the studio. They're going to be reading the text. You can ask them questions and you can imagine the kind of text that is going to come in tonight because we are talking about a sensitive issue, LGBT, and we'll provide you the history for that. So don't go anywhere. This is Good Evening Ghana. It's the best. Uh, let's take our break. Uh, three minutes for commercial break. Back in the studio and I'll talk for two minutes about the expulsion of Koku Anyedoho from the NDC by Johnson Asiedun Katia. Just two minutes, and then we go to the Supreme Court. We'll be right back. The search for a reliable partner in the sale of U-turn buses Genuine spare parts, its repairs and maintenance at a highly effective workshop with remarkable speed. We also have available the sale of Camel car batteries, which I and Kia spare parts, Zonton coaches and light duty vehicles for everyday movement. Contact us on 020-000-0831 or 54 you can also email us info at seautomobilegh.com or visit our website at www.seautomobilegh.com. SA Automobile, the pleasure of doing business with you is all ours. handkerchief gets dirty and wet after wiping your sweat or blowing your nose with it keeping a dirty handkerchief in your pocket or bag is very unhygienic reusing it increases your chances of getting sick from germs that is why i always use flour disposable handkerchiefs flour disposable handkerchiefs is disposable thus making it a more hygienic option it's thick and very absorbent 
tissues in a pack per disposable handkerchief is better than a cloth handkerchief. Mommy, my disposable handkerchief. Look out for floor toilet roll, there are multi-purpose paper towels, floor table napkins, and floor box tissues in a shop near you. For bill purchases, call Delta Paper Mail on 0243-033-033. Bringing you Africa's creme de la creme's classiest hangouts, award shows, end of year parties, Wedding, graduations, birthdays, fashion or corporate events. Metro Social has got you covered. We present Pazars with Jeanne of Sequoia. Give us a call and we will be there. Whilst at that, join us on Metro Social every Friday at 9.30pm and a repeat on Saturdays and Sundays at 8.30pm on Metro TV. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome back. Ten minutes past nine. We're running out of time already. Tonight we're going all the way to eleven. And as I, I, I uh, in indicated the last time, now we're going to we're not going to pause uh, and and we're not going to pause on Metro TV and go on Facebook. We're running all the way to eleven. However, at ten o'clock we'll go to the newsroom and take the news line for fifteen minutes, ten to fifteen minutes, and come back and continue with the show all the way to eleven and beyond eleven. Today I guess we'll go beyond eleven because we have a lot to talk about. Okay, so here is our commentary. Well, it's a commentary, it's a montage on what has just happened in the National Democratic Congress where Koku Anyedoho, former Deputy General Secretary, has been fired. He's been expelled from the party. There's a montage for it. We want to assure our supporters and Ghanaians that President Mahama is in a comfortable lead as far as the presidential vote is concerned. <laughs> Assure our supporters and Ghanaians that President Mahama is in a comfortable lead as far as the presidential vote is concerned. <laughs> Okay, sorry if you couldn't read what we wrote there because we didn't have much time. We'll do it again. We'll put it on again. Uh, now, though, let's go uh, to our um, touch screen and listen to our analysis of the Chief Justice versus Kwesi Efrifa versus Oje Dom, whom we are introducing to you for the first time. Here's a story. So we have an important obligation to discharge. And the first part of tonight's show on Good Evening Ghana. Now, we have gone very far to understand all what is happening at the General Legal Council. Now, you know that a lawyer called Kwesi Efrifa uh, made some allegations against the Chief Justice about bribery, etc. You know that the National Democratic Congress held a press conference on this. You also know that in that press conference, they asked the Chief Justice to recuse himself. So what did we do? We have gone into the courts and understood everything that has happened. Um, everything relating to the case that is in court about which some people do not know and and why the things that have happened happened the substance of the allegation is that 
Afrifa, the lawyer, says that the Chief Justice is asking for $5 million and 500000 has been paid by a former client of his. Who is this client? What was the matter about? What was the case about? What has the Supreme Court got to do with it? That's what we're going to unravel right now so that you can get the full facts of the matter. Now, this man is important. Ojidom Obrenu Kwesiata. He is the centerpiece of all the allegations. He is the one... Uh, who is the former client of uh, Kwesi Frifa, and uh, he's the one who was also denied the allegations, but he's also the one who sent an ap application or a, a, a matter to the General Legal Council saying that Kwesi Frifa owes him money. How did their relationship get sour? We will bring everything to you. And is Kwesi Frifa really telling us the truth? The facts are going to be here right now. So, this is Ojie uh, We know him. Kwesi Afrifa is the other important person in this matter. We know him now. This is uh, His Lordship Justice Eni Eboa. He is uh, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, uh, whom we all know. This is Tony Akutuampao, who is a lawyer, who is now a lawyer in the matter. Another lawyer for Ojie And this is the, the Satellite Towers. Now, that's interesting. The satellite towers. We're going to show you why it's there and what it means. And then, uh, this is a map of Gomua, somewhere in Gomua, Gomua Asin, uh, Gomua somewhere. That's also uh, interesting in the matter. So, what's the matter? Let's get back to Ojidom. Let's get back to Ojidom because he's central uh, to all of this conversation. So, Ojidom is a chief in Gomua. He has land, many lands. He suspects that a land that belongs to him has been illegally appropriated by government. This land was taken by the Lands Commission and was given to Ghana Telecom for the purpose of deployment of satellites. That's the purpose of where the land was taken in the 1960s. This land was taken in the 1960s. So by the time it was taken, Ojidom was not a chief. Some other person was the chief. Okay. So Ojidom gets worried about the situation that my land has been taken for some purpose and is given to Ghana Telecom. Remember, Ghana Telecom is no longer there. It's Vodafone. The British telecom giant acquired shares in Ghana Telecom, became Vodafone. They inherited the assets and the liabilities of Ghana Telecom. And so all of those assets are now for Vodafone. Okay. So Ajidom goes to court and says, he sues Lands Commission and he sues Vodafone. Okay. At the Swedru High Court, Lands Commission are not able to show that they have documents for the land. They are not also able to show that if they actually acquired the land under the law, that compensation was paid. The land acquired in the 1960s. They are not able to show anything. The high court says, but how can you do that? If you can't show, then you need to pay Ojidom for using the land for all this while, for the purpose of satellite deployment, 16 million United States dollars. This is Ojidom. 16 million United States dollars. This is Swedro High Court. So Justice Eniabua has not yet come in. Justice Doche is not in. The Supreme Court is not in. This is the story. A high court Swedro says pay him 16 million United States dollars because you don't have any details, any documents to show that you, you took his land legally. Now, the Vodafone people are concerned about it. So they go to the Court of Appeal in Cape Coast. They sue. The Court of Appeal goes through the same process. Where are your documents for the land? They don't have the documents. They don't have the executive instruments. Court of Appeal says, no, the High Court was right. You owe a JDOM 16 million uh, CDs, uh, dollars, 16 million United States dollars. Okay. So Vodafone are concerned with their lawyers. And they say that, okay, give us a stay of execution. They ask the court that you give us a stay of execution. That is to say, hold on to the judgment. Yes, we have lost. Yes, we owe him. But hold on to it. We don't have to pay it now. Let it be that we don't pay now whilst we file an application again. Okay. The Court of Appeal in Cape Coast says, no problem. We will hold it. But because you lost the case and you've lost the case with us, uh, you owe him $60 million. We will give you only a partial stay. Go and pay Ojidom $4 million. Ojidom receives $4 million from the Vodafone and Lands Commission people as, as a part payment of the judgment, part execution of the judgment. So that's what happens. Okay, Vodafone are now preparing to go to the Supreme Court. Now, whilst they are preparing, they take on another matter. They get investigators and their lawyers and they go into the Lands Commission and do a real thorough work. You know, people know that Lands Commission documents can get missing and all of that. They are trying to automate it. But yes, these things happen in Ghana all the time, we know. So they say, let's get people on the ground to find the information. And oh la la, guess what happens? Vodafone goes in there and they find Executive Instrument 86, which was the executive instrument upon which Ojidom's land was taken. 
Compensation. Compensation was paid to Odidon's predecessor, 1969. Vodafone get all this information. They are excited. That's what it is. Odidom is under pressure right now. Odidom and his lawyer, Akwesi Frifa, are now under pressure. So this is a trajectory of the case. Suedru High Court, Cape Coast Court of Appeal, stay of execution, a partial stay. Odidom and his lawyers are, uh, Odidom has been paid 4 million United States dollars. Vodafone are excited because right now, they are going to go to the Supreme Court. And what are they going to do at the Supreme Court? They are going to ask the Supreme Court to do something new. Something not totally new, but something interesting. They're going to ask the Supreme Court that we have now found the documents. The land was properly acquired. Compensation was paid. We have found the documents, so allow us to open the case and bring new evidence. This is what takes the matter to the Supreme Court. This is what brings in Justice Eniye Boa, the Chief Justice. A panel is set up. Justice Eniye Boa is not even on the panel of five. Let's move on to the story and see what happens. Justice Doche is the chairman of the panel of five members at the Supreme Court. This is getting interesting. So the panel of five is being led by his lordship, Justice Jones Doche. Now, that panel of five excludes the learned chief justice, Mr. Justice Eni Yeboa. We have to get that clear. The panel of five that is hearing this, or it don't matter. This is the Vodafone's appeal to the Supreme Court from the Court of Appeal. Vodafone have now found evidence that they have a case, that they didn't have to pay $4 million, that they should have won the high court case in Swedru if only the executive instrument had been found in good time by Lance Commission. Nonetheless, it has been found now. Okay, so they are going to the Supreme Court with an application to ask the Supreme Court that we want to re-argue our matter we, because we have found fresh evidence and the legal procedure allows for that. The civil procedure rules allow for that. That they can go to Supreme Court and say, we now have fresh evidence. Can we re-argue the matter that we argued already in the High Court? Can the Supreme Court allow us to do so? Now, this panel, uh, the panel of five right now, is, is led by Justice Doche and it excludes Justice Eni Yeboah. Okay. So there's a bit of uh, legal novelty in the whole application to the Supreme Court. Aspects of it uh, is a no legal novelty. We don't want to bore you with that because it's typically for lawyers. But all you need to know is that at the Supreme Court stage, there are aspects of this application that bring up, throw up a legal, a, a legal novelty. Now, Justice Doche is telling himself that because the Supreme Court is the highest court of the land, whenever it gives a ruling on application and procedure that ruling ought to be obeyed by all the courts down court of appeal high court circuit court all of them must obey the supreme court's interpretation of a procedural matter this oj don versus vodafone case now before the supreme court with new evidence found evidence which was not available at the high so that we have an enhanced panel of the supreme court to look at this matter so the ruling that comes out of the supreme court because it's going to be binding on all other courts in terms of the procedure that ruling is substantial that it is heard by as many as seven supreme court judges let's see the letter that justice Doche wrote to justice Eniyeboa, telling the chief justice that our panel of five may be insufficient to deal with this substantial matter because it's a matter that will impinge on the, the ruling of the courts and all what the other courts will do. Let's see that letter. Now, this is the letter that uh, Justice Jones Doche wrote to uh, the Chief Justice, and he copied all the other judges in the case. It is a letter that is written on 24th January 2020. It is written to His Lordship, the Chief Justice, it is written from the hand of Justice Victor J. M. Doche. Uh, it is copied to Justice Apao, Justice Puaman, Justice Mafosao, and Justice Professor Ni Ashikote, Justices of the Supreme Court. The subject of this letter is a request for enhanced panel of the Supreme Court to consider ruling in suit number JS1312019 instituted. Uh, Ojidom Obreno Kwesiata versus Ghana Telecom Limited and Lands Commission. Let's get the details of the letter in a way that you can see it. So this is how it starts. That's is Doche writes to the Lord Chief Justice. This is to respectfully inform you that I am the presiding judge in the suits listed above, suits number so so and so, instituted um, 
Ojedom Obrenu Kwesiata versus Ghana Telecom and Lands Commission. I also wish to further inform you that the panel had adjourned the suit for ruling to Wednesday, 22nd of January 2020. However, due to the Christmas holidays, the panel was unable to hold judgment conference on time. As a result, we have had the ruling adjourned to Wednesday, 5th of February 2020. However, during our deliberations at our judgment conference on Thursday, 23rd January 2020, it emerged that the main issue that calls for our determination is that of the proper scope of executable and non-executable judgment and how these affect the principles for the grant of stay of execution. Now, I told you before that uh, the, the matter before the Supreme Court was calling for a very detailed ruling on the procedure rules and i didn't want to bore you with that so don't worry that's that's what the lawyers call it uh, executable and non-executable uh, non-executable judgment and how these can affect the principles for the grant of stay of execution so this fundamental procedural matter was going to be ruled upon once vodafone have filed an application before the supreme court asking for uh, the court to allow them to show the new evidence this executable non-executable whatever they call it that's that's the procedural matter upon which justice Doce is telling the chief justice that the ruling will now require this decision to be made it will be a far reaching decision because the consequences will be far reaching i should say because it will impinge on how all the other courts manage this executable and non-executable executable judgments and how they affect the principles of stay of execution okay let's move on Anticipating that the resolution of this issue in the ruling might necessitate a departure from the settled authorities of the court, we respectfully crave your indulgence to enhance the panel to seven to enable us rehear the matter to be in a better position to deal with the issue with, with the issue comprehensively. Very, very interesting. I, I really like Justice Doce for this. Uh, this particular intervention he made. He's telling the Lord Chief Justice that a resolution of this matter might occasion a departure from what is already known in the courts. What, that's what he means by settled authorities. So that there's a procedure that all the courts adopt when it comes to the grant of stay of execution in executable and non-executable. Forget about that for now. There's something, let's call it, there's something that the lawyers always do when it comes to procedure. Justice Doche is suggesting that Considering this Vodafone matter and what they are being invited to do, the thing that the lawyers always do may have to change. There may have to be a departure from that for new learning, something new, something more progressive. He's, he's suspecting that in looking at this Vodafone and Ojedon matter, given this new evidence matter, there may be some fundamental changes to the procedure of what they had already known. So he's asking the Chief Justice to enhance the panel so that they will be able to deal with the matter comprehensively. Okay, let's see the last sentence. Respectfully submitted, Justice Jones Duce. So, this is the letter that the Chief Justice received. The letter Chief Justice then agrees with Justice Duce, and so uh, he brings in two more people into the matter. So, from five, now there are seven. That is himself and another judge. The Lord Chief Justice brings in himself and another judge. So there are seven. The seven judges then make this ruling. Listen, listen to what happened. So the judges are now seven. We know that already. The seven judges then make this. And let's read it. It says, on the 28th of April 2020, the Chief Justice presided over an enhanced panel who went ahead to grant an order for stay of execution of Ojedom's judgment. In other words, the Chief Justice led the court to order that the execution of Ojedom's judgment be suspended until the determination of the appeal by the Supreme Court. Now, this is very serious because here, uh, the Chief Justice, the man who they say is in cahoots with Ojedom and uh, has promised Ojedom something and Ojedom wants to bribe him, uh, he's leading a panel to actually say to Ojedom that we are going to stay the execution of the judgment that you have. We will not allow you to enjoy the, uh, the benefits of the judgment that you have. We will not allow that judgment to be executed because of the new evidence that Vodafone has found. This is the Chief Justice leading that charge. Now, the CJ doesn't just end there by uh, leading the panel to grant the stay of execution 
so that Ojedom cannot enjoy the benefits of what he is in, supposed to get, he does something else. Have a look. Let's look at 13. It says, the chief justice also led the panel to make an additional order, consequential order, which was not even specifically asked for by Vodafone and its lawyers, that Ojedom should refund into court the part payment of the judgment debt of some four million United States dollars that had already been paid Vodafone. Ojedom was ordered to pay four million into courts. That's that's very serious. So this is the Chief Justice who comes in into the matter, invited by Justice Doche to enhance the panel because of what they needed to do. We've talked about that already. He comes and he leads the panel in a unanimous decision to say that no, 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 Ojedom. That judgment that you won in the Swedru High Court, the execution of that judgment, we will state because there's new evidence coming that shows that maybe you shouldn't have won that judgment. This is the Chief Justice. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to say that that four million that the Court of Appeal gave you, the one the Court of Appeal said you have won a judgment of 16 million, the opponents are appealing. We will give them a partial stay. However, they should pay you four million United States dollars, being 20% of the, the, what is entitled to you from the judgment. Chief Justice says, no, even that money that you receive, return it. Return the money in, in, in one month. This is the Chief Justice who is said to be on the side of Ojidong in this matter, leading a panel to do something that even Vodafone didn't ask for. Vodafone didn't ask for it. They just went and said that, can you stay the execution? They've already paid the four million. They are waiting for when the matter ends and they win. They said, can you stay? Chief Justice says, we will not just stay. Ojie, don't pay back the money. Now, here is the evidence of the money being paid. This is, this is, this is a, a, a document from the court. And uh, it's Ojie, Dom, Obreu, versus Ghana Telecom, the parties, etc., etc. This is the court order. We put the court order in a bigger size so that you can see it. Here is the court order. And it's signed by Justice Eniebua, the presiding judge. It says, the unanimous decision of the court is that the application is granted, as the application for stay is granted as prayed. Any money that has been paid under the order, which is the subject of this repeat application, must be paid into court within one month from today. J. Dom is looking at this matter, he's hot. He's very to the court that Justice Doche, Justice Eni Eboa, leave the bench, recuse himself, recuse yourself, don't be part of my matter anymore. Now, this is the same Justice Doche that it is being said, that the same Justice Eni Eboa, that is being said that he's in cahoots with Ojidom, but Ojidom wrote a letter to him. After the, Ojidom saw the way that the trajectory of the case, he now begins to feel under pressure. And his reaction to the pressure, together with his lawyer, is this petition. The petition, it is signed by, uh, it is uh, to his lordship, the Chief Justice. It's in the matter of Ojee Domobrunu versus Ghana Telecom. Uh, it's a civil motion. It's a petition. He's alleging against the Chief Justice that once upon a time, during the pendency of this matter, the Chief Justice made a comment and uh, a quote saying that, in relation to the land and in relation to this case, that which village land could sell for as much uh, as that sum of money. Now, Ojee Dom here is alleging against the Chief Justice that the Chief Justice may be biased towards him. Not just the Chief Justice, but Justice Doche as well. And he's writing a petition that the two of them should leave the panel uh, so that he can go on with the matter. Let's see the allegation that he raised against Justice Doche. Well, for Justice Doche, he talks about uh, something Justice Doche said uh, relating to the fact that evidence was being suppressed, which is the evidence about lands commissions, executive instruments, and the compensation that Justice Doche, in another matter, referred to his matter and said that the matter that he was hearing is similar to another matter where evidence was being suppressed. Against the Chief Justice Niebua, he says that uh, he once upon said that which village land could sell for that much money in reference to the land. For, so for these two reasons, Odidom wrote to the Chief Justice that I want you and Justice Doche to recuse yourself from my, from my case. And, and he can do that. The justice system allows that. So he wrote that letter. Now the Chief Justice responded. Let's have a look at the response. This is how he responded to the petition that has been filed. Because when petitions are filed, you need to respond. Uh, this is response. So this is the original handwritten response uh, of the Chief Justice. In a letter he wrote to Justice Doche. And you know that it's uh, a letterhead from the desk 
of the uh, Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana is a note, and he writes to Justice Doche. Uh, he scribbled this for Justice Doche to have a look at. Let's see what is in it. Uh, we have expanded it uh, so you can see it well. He says to Justice Doche, my brother, I want you to, as usual, read and digest this petition, which is certainly coming from a lawyer, but is hiding behind the plaintiff appellant. I hope we can put our heads together and decide the way forward. CJ, and that letter is written on the 29th, 09, uh, 2020. So the Chief Justice wrote this to Justice uh, Jones Doche. They put their head together and they dismissed the application. The application for bias for them to recuse themselves was dismissed uh, by, by, the, uh, by the Chief Justice and Justice Doche by the court. They dismissed the application and they continued to sit on the matter. Coming back to the facts, you know, this is the same Chief Justice against whom an allegation is being made of bias against Ojedom. And this is the same Chief Justice that is being said that Ojedom is in cahoots with him. That's totally illogical. But we'll get to the details. So application dismissed. Ojedom now turns his guns on his lawyer and the fight now begins. He's worried. He's frustrated uh, because it looks like he's not getting what he wants. So he fires his lawyer. He fires a FIFA. And he goes to the General Legal Council to demand some money. This, this is a matter now that everybody knows about. Ojee Dom says to the lawyer that you said I should give you 100000 And I have to add that whatever we are publishing here about what Ojee Dom said is what Ojee Dom is testifying to. Here at Good Evening Ghana, we have no basis to make a claim that is true or that is not true. We don't know. In the interest of the public and in the interest of public broadcasting, we are bringing this to you. So this is what Ojee Dom is saying. That's what he's told the General Legal Council. So Ojee Dom is saying to a general legal counsel that he wants his $100,000 back because lawyer Chrissy Afrifa said to him that if you pay $100,000 in addition to the $300,000 that you have paid, then I will be able to work on your case for you. But by this time, Ojee Dom sees that he is losing every application in the court. And as a matter of fact, the court is asking him to pay back the $4 million. He's losing every application and the money that he has already received the Chief Justice says, pay the money back within one month. He's wondering if it's true that he gave his lawyer $100,000 for gymnastics. Where, what's happening? What is going on? The lawyer is losing everything. He fires the lawyer and he goes to hire Akoto Ampao. He goes for Tony Akoto Ampao as his new lawyer. And he writes to the General Legal Counsel that he's looking for his money. He said that the lawyer has already returned $25,000 and the lawyer is yet to give him a balance of $75,000. He says all efforts to retrieve the remaining amount have failed. He's therefore appealing to the chairman of the General Legal Council of Lawyers to help him retrieve his $75,000 United States dollars from lawyer Kwesi Afrifa, his lawyer. Afrifa then goes on to make the spurious allegations uh, for which we are finding against him uh, tonight. He said that he, that is Ojee Edom, further informed me that the Chief Justice had demanded a bribe of five million United States dollars for a successful outcome to his case, and that he, Ojidom, had already paid five hundred thousand dollars to the Chief Justice. Now let's let's look at this. Now we have seen the trajectory of the case. We know the trajectory of the case. Chief Justice, with this kind of trajectory of case, where Ojidom has lost all the applications, including losing the, the four million being asked to pay back the $4 million, where the Chief Justice had ruled against Ojee Adom's interest in all aspects of the case, this Chief Justice is demanding $5 million of the case that is already destroyed. He's demanding $5 million United States dollars from the man who got $4 million from the Court of Appeal that the Chief Justice says, pay that $4 million back because you are unlikely to win this case. That Chief Justice is demanding $5 million from the man that he has asked to pay back $4 million. And from a case that looks like it's not working, the Chief Justice is demanding $5 million from a man who, he has, uh, who uh, the, the Chief Justice has been petitioned against. This Ojee Adon petitions the court that Chief Justice will recuse himself, he and Justice Doche, because he doesn't think that he's going to get justice with them. He goes back to that Chief Justice and he tells his lawyer that the same Chief Justice is demanding $5 million United States bribe. Viewers, what can you can you make a head and tail of this? This cannot be true. Any child will know that. But if you want, if somebody is asking a bribe from you, there has to be some circumstantial 
matters that indicate that there was some connection between the two. But where the man is, is ruling on applications against you consistently, where the man is ruling consistently against you, he has dealt the coup de grace to you by asking you to pay back money because of new evidence. How is that man also going to ask for a bribe of $5 million when it looks like you're not going to win the case? He has led a panel into a position where you have put Oji Adom's chances of winning this case into dire straits. Oji Adom's chances of winning this case is, is dire. How then does he come and say that you are going to take five? I mean, nobody knows how the courts will rule. Everybody has to wait for how the courts will rule. But sometimes you can look at it and make some projections. And that's not prejudging the matter. That's just saying that this matter is looking very interesting. So anyway, we don't know how the courts will rule, but this bribery allegation is funny. This bribery allegation is totally incongruous. But that's what uh, the man tells his people. That's what he tells the General Legal Council. Then he comes back to his own matters. This is a FIFA I'm talking about. He says that the, the client wanted the money back. Now, that the, both of them, both Afrifa and Oje don't talk about bring money back. Oje Adam says, I told him, bring my 100000 back. Afrifa says, the client says he wants the fees back. And the fees that was paid in cities, he, Afrifa, is going to pay him in dollars. So the 300,000 came to 50,000 cities. That's what he says. And out of the 50,000 cities, he has paid an amount of $25,000 uh, to him. And he says he has also paid $15,000 to him. And the total is therefore $40,000. So there's an outstanding of $10,000. That's the funny part. The man has paid you 300,000 cities as your fees, your your legitimate legal fees for all the work that you have done. You say the man says he's going to pay a bribe, so he needs his money back. And he needs his money back, you are paying him in dollars. The man says it is my, must be paid back. That's another important point. So Chief Justice says that in the interest of justice, for justice to be served, Oji Adam should not get his money. No, he shouldn't. Okay. But somehow, uh, Chief Justice proceeds and says, for the further interest of justice, the $4 million Oji Adam has already gotten as part payment from Vodafone. He should return it for the interest of justice. In the interest of justice, the learned Chief Justice rules that that $4 million should be returned. This is the second point. That, is that also not very surprising? The third one. Uh, from the above, all of what we have said, is it not clear that the Chief Justice has never granted any motion in favor of Oji Adam? That is the point I was making. If you look at the, the process, all of what has happened, the learned chief justice in Iebua has never granted any of the motions that have come before the court in favor of Ojedom. He's refused all the motions, even the motion that Ojedom won, which is that he also can present fresh evidence to contradict, if he can, the Vodafone fresh evidence, which the court thought in the interest of justice that should be. Majority of the members said Ojedom can also bring new evidence. And Iebua said no, he was the only one. So that in all the applications, he's ruled on every matter against Ojedom. This is a man that he's demanding a bribe of $5 million from. You are demanding a bribe of $5 million from somebody and you are ruling against him consistently. I mean, where does this happen? So we write here and we say that in the light of the foregoing, ladies and gentlemen, viewers, will the reasonable and objective mind not reach the conclusion that the allegations made against the Chief Justice by lawyer Kwesi Frifa is palpably false, incurably bogus, and the figment of the imagination of an individual who is actuated by it has to be malice or something else because really this doesn't add up an, an allegation is made against you by your client that you have to re return money you go you in reply you said the client says the chief justice wants some money we come and dig into the case and look at everything that has happened in the case we see that the chief justice is ruling his posturing legal posturing his jurisprudential posturing has all been against the person that they said he's asking for money from how, how is that possible the person says i've already paid him half a million dollars and all the, the jurisprudential posturing of the learned chief justice in the interest of justice is against ojedom and a free says ojedom told him well we know that ojedom has denied that allegation he's denied it flatly that he's never told the free that that he's never even met the chief justice he's never he's just seen him in court ojedom has made that factual denial akotom power has made a factual denial as well but beyond all of the denials if you look at 
the trajectory of the events we have showed you, the details of what has happened in court, can anybody come to the conclusion that, I mean, that's what we talk about. Article 125 of the 1992 Constitution. The judiciary is one of the only last leg of things that we have. The judiciary is a stabilizing factor. If you look at Ghana and the rest of West Africa and look at instability around the place, you will see that the judiciary in Ghana, the judiciary has saved us from an election petition in 2013 after the election petition in 2013. Or if you like, before the election petition in 2013, the country was boiling. After the election petition, the, the vanquished side accepted defeat. They went back to work. After the election petition of 2020, you saw what happened. The NDC went back to work. Before the election petition, they were on the street. After the election petition verdict, they went back to work. So this judiciary is a holding factor. It's a pivot around which our democracy revolves. And that's why, as a public interest broadcaster, we are in, uh, interested in this matter. Because if we allow people to destroy the judiciary because of a personal discontent, and make such and that's why we took time to go and understand this matter what has happened what is the case what's happening in the supreme court what is it about that's why we took time to understand all of that and after understanding all of that and getting all the gamut of information our conclusion is that it has to be malice but malice should not be used to bring down the institution of the judiciary because for you and i all of us that's what we have that's what we have that's why we are going to zangilewa like fifa better luck next time Set up lawyer FIFA, we love you, but you cannot bring down the most important institution. And for political parties, journalists, let's be circumspect in our comments. Let's get the facts, let's get the real facts. And that's what we talk about all the time. Let's get the facts before we talk. That's why we have gone to bring you everything that is in the matter. What we have showed you tonight is everything in the matter. That's why we have showed you everything in the matter. Lawyer could say FIFA is a Zangelewa man tonight. He's a Zangelewa lawyer, and he should never do this again. Give it to him. Zangelewa. Okay, so now the big story starts, and uh, uh, the forces are coming together, you see. Okay, so that's the story for you. You can comment on it uh, onto our people. When we take our break for Newsline, they'll read the comments. Champion man. Uh, uh, good evening. A very good evening to you. Yeah, I, I have to say that you are doing well, and that you have won the appreciation of many, and that on the side of what you have taken, you have taken the side of Calvary's resurrection, and many of us stand with you. I'm grateful. We're doing yeah. the Lord's work and the work we're paid to do. Okay, but tonight we'll ask you all the questions. Very well. And then, uh, and then we can deal with it. You tell us what's happening uh, with the processes in Parliament. People must understand that as well. Definitely. Where is the bill? What is it going to do in Parliament? Before then, let's just take a little bit of the time to give you and our viewers the real history of this matter. Kuku is going to join me uh, in the studio. Kuku, come, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the history. So he has been working on this uh, for the last two days, all the research and all of that. So uh, tell us. Where is, the, where is this coming from, this, the prohibition of uh, gay sex, if you like? Where is it coming from? So the first known statutory prohibition of these activities was by King Henry VIII, way back in the 1500s. Henry the VIII of, of England? Yes, Henry VIII of England. He was against it? Yes. Okay. And he used it um, by passing it. Certain Catholic monks were incarcerated and their lands were seized. 
and vested in the crown. But the modern for, for them participating in gay sex. Yes, at the their time. lands were seized. Which yes, year is this? this? In the 1500s, around okay. 1550 thereabouts. Okay. But the modern, um, the popular modern connotation of it or its criminalization was in the English Parliament in 1885 mm -hmm. through the Labouchere Amendments to the Criminal and Other Offences Act of 1885. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this amendment was to criminalize same-sex relations between two consenting male adults. That was what was actually used and enforced till the Wolf in the Report on Homosexual Offences in 1957 recommended that it ought to be no longer necessary. However, from then, it was then exported to common law jurisdictions of the world. Particularly, that common law jurisdictions are nations that were colonized by England. Mm -hmm. But that was a statutory restriction. It does not necessarily mean that African customs or African traditional um, settings did not frown on it. Okay, I, I, I know that, but I, would, I want us to see whether there is actually a linkage yeah. between our colonial relations and, the, and this prohibition. Because yeah. if you look at the, f the, the picture today, yeah. you will see the African on one side and the, uh, right. the white man on one side, the European on one side. But what you are telling us is, is interesting, that the European and the African used to be on the same side on this matter. And that, in fact, they actually codified it under King James. So, but the bond of 1844 will predate your 1960, isn't it? And the bond yes. of 1844 had yeah. some prohibitions of yes. ritual murder, pioneering, yes. and all of that. Yes. But that didn't say, the bond didn't say, yeah, thank you for putting that up there. Okay. The bond didn't say, um, they didn't prohibit gay, gay. The crown thought was not right. Therefore, it was imperative that these laws were exported to compel them to do what the crown thought was right, even when they were in the, um, in the colonies, in Gold Coast well, that's and other areas. Like, what you're saying is that there was suspicion that this, this practice, yes. which at the time in the eyes of the British was a uh, prohibited practice, yes. will be carried out when they get outside the shores of Britain, yes. when they come to the colonial places. So the law was exported to be yes. able to catch them even yes. when they do that in Sierra Leone, in Ghana, Ghana in Nigeria, India, and in Burma, yes. and all of that. Exactly. That's interesting. That's, that's very far-reaching. That's, that that's why mm. many common law countries, that's countries formerly colonized by UK, used a similar wording. Either they use Bagri, or they use a natural carnal knowledge. Mm. So the roots is, is, is similar. The roots of statutory restriction is similar. But then we decided again in 1960 to then adopt our own sort of, our own... Um, criminal offense, mm -hmm. uh, criminal offenses act. It used to be the criminal code, but it was changed in 2005 to be the criminal and other offenses act through the review of VCRAC CRAB. Mm -hmm. And in section 104 of this um, act, these actions are prohibited. It is interesting to note, however, that section 104 restricts or prevents or prohibits sexual relations even between a man and a woman in an unnatural manner. So it is sexual relations in an unnatural manner or sexual relations with an animal therefore if there there is no penetration to the the vagina it is restricted by law by the even if it's a man and a woman even if it's a man and a woman let me ask some judge is that correct that that unnatural uh, sex even with a woman is prohibited by by act act 29 criminal offenses act well if you look at the republic versus badusin where the judge, the Supreme Court, tried to distinguish what is canal, natural canal knowledge. Mm -hmm. they, they, they seem to suggest that when it is not penetrative, it is deemed, when, when it is not penetrating the vagina, it is, it is deemed to be canal uh, natural knowledge. Yes. So that's also prohibited. Yes. Does that find expression in the bill that you are supporting? Yes. So right now what we are trying to do is to have reflections that cover lesbianism and all other manifestations which um, the limited definition of a natural canal knowledge in section 104 of act 29 seem to have a challenge with but if i could quickly add yeah. giving the perspective he's bringing you should bear in mind that the the law has its spirit in his letter what was the spirit in 1960 61 years 18, ago uh, 1960 okay. yes the, the criminal, the, the, the criminal act. offenses mm -hmm. act um at that time what did we know as homosexuality? It was largely gays. Mm -hmm. And that's how come springing from the, the, the bond of 18, uh, for the one, for the four, you realize that it is largely focused on gays. And because mm -hmm. at that time, things like pansexualism, transgenders, queers were an unknown entity at the time. And so these are latter day additions. And you realize that even today, as we speak, the new variations of homosexuality that are still being discovered. 
mm. you get it. So we may end up with all you the. You answer the question I was going to ask you before we yeah. take our break. I was going to ask you why is this law inadequate? And many people have asked you that on social Definitely. media. I think you answered that in part. We'll get sure. to that in some detail. Uh, so, so you heard what he was talking about. Let's yeah. talk about this paria state. This is yeah. another question I'll be asking him. Yeah. That if we do that, and you have you have seen that. Uh, Madina MP Sosu has talked about that. Yes. And Gabi Oshirako has talked about yeah. that. That if we proceed with this, we, will, we could become a pariah state. Tell us about the, what international law says about these things. Now, that is the dicey um, area. The international law, um, the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, in the case of Tunin versus Australia, noted that sexual, um, man the manifestation of sexuality is a human right. But the problem with that is that decisions of committees of human rights commissions of com convention against torture international courts and things of the sort are not binding sources of international law so in order for you to ascertain or in order for you to say that indeed this is fundamentally a human right because if you look at the first generation of rights your civil and political rights social economic rights these are rights that have generally been accepted Indeed, as the right, right of association. I mean, the yes, bill yes. is the bill is banning the advocacy Associ and the yes. right of association. It, could that be problematic? As honestly, I feel that is quite um, problematic because um, association does not necessarily, or ad association or advocacy may not necessarily mean engaging in the act. For instance, if we have people that advocate for using of marijuana, it doesn't necessarily mean that they use marijuana. But if marijuana is illegal, mm -hmm. how do you then permit the advocacy of it? Well. Ghanaians having um, free speech was illegal at a point. And we, advocate, we advocated to be independent, same in South Africa and many places. Free so, speech is fundamental. It's mm -hmm. a first generation right. Yeah. Is homosexuality first generation right? Uh, that's just, that, so that's the problem. That's where we go back to Tunin versus Australia and how it is not really widespread. But if you even look at the nature, if you look at Article 2, Clause 7 of the UN Charter, it provides that so internal matters of states uh, are not subject to. Um, interference by the United Nations and it is left for us to determine what and what we decide to accept. If you also look at Article 27, Clause 2 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, it's provided that the manifestation of rights of individuals is subject to the collective good and to public morality, even though there is an interpretation on that. Mm -hmm. In 2017, the African Court on Human Rights interpreted that provision in the decision of the African Commission for Human and People's Rights versus Kenya on paragraph 188 of the report that in order to fall within this provision, two elements must be, pre must be present. The first is that the enjoyment of that right must adversely affect the entire society. Mm -hmm. And two, that the restriction must be commensurate with the threats that the enjoyment of that harm provides. Therefore, if we say that our restriction has to be in tandem with international law, then we have to show that the enjoyment of or the manifestation of homosexuality and other related um, matters in adversely affects the larger society. I like the way he used enjoyment, enjoyment of homosexuality. Uh, Uncle Sam, I have to take your time again for the news. Uh, so we'll take the news and then we'll come back. So we're going to news line. Is, uh, is Aldo Moro ready? Uh, can I see him? Can I hear him? Uh, Moro, can you hear me? Okay, he can't hear me. Okay, so I'll go straight down and take uh, Aldo Moro for the news and then we'll come back. And uh, when we come back, we have an hour conversation with some George. Uh, for viewers on Metro TV, you would continue to see, you would continue to see the, uh, the, the text message being read of what we have so far. Okay, MCR is coming in for more. So now, so on Facebook, let me come to you then, uh, Matilda. Maybe you can join her. Okay. Uh, do you have some messages to read? Yes. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so... I'll, I'll be sitting with some George. Go ahead. All right. I'll have Bob CD says, Thank God it's Tuesday. I am happy to be alive and strong to watch you, Paul. The best evening program so far and best journalist. Graham Nagel says, Please, no one is against this drafted bill before Parliament, but we are much concerned about what it entails. All we want is that there should be a second look at it. We expect that when the dust settles, the right shall prevail over emotion. Studio number nine, Doctor Isaac Street, Northridge. This is Newsline. Well, it's 10 p.m. and the news just got started. Let me say good evening to you and welcome to Newsline on Metro TV. We're live on DSTV channel 277. We're also streaming live on Facebook at Metro News and on Twitter at Metro TV GH. I am Moro Awudu. Now, here's what's here is what is coming up in the next 15 minutes. 
The National Democratic Congress expels the party's former Deputy General Secretary, Kokwa Nyidoho. What does this mean for the, for the party's gains? We will be engaging poster benefiting on this matter. Also, the minority caucus is accusing the first Deputy Speaker, Joseph Osewusu, of shielding the embattled Member of Parliament for Asin Central, Kennedy Japan, in that contempt case brought against him. A newsline is always brought to you by Delta Paper, producers of floral disposable tissue. Newsline returns shortly. What a picture! What do AD plus decoder? Oh, multi TV and now natural land agent PR. Natural local channels now HD. The hear so better. Star eight seven nine hash. Numbers from Kubu box you and now the activity AD. Yes, an HD Blast decoder from now till the 9th of August for just $89.99 Ghana CDs and enjoy three months free subscription. Enjoy all the excitement and life force action in the HD Blast Air Bossu Fini Fini Promo. Promo lasts from 7 June to 9th August 2021. Visit hd-plus.com.gh or call 024 243 9872 for more info. What the you brutal. Half a nose for good things. <laughs> And welcome back to the news program. Our first story is the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, has sacked its former Deputy General Secretary, Kokwa Nyidoho. In a letter addressed to Mr. Nyidoho, the party stated that the decision comes after the Functional Executive Committee considered the report and recommendations of the National Disciplinary Committee on the case of misconduct and anti-party behavior brought against him. Now, portions of the report reads, the committee's report found you guilty of the said allegations of misconduct and anti-party behavior and recommended your outright expulsion from the party. You are therefore, by the decision of FEC, expelled from the National Democratic Congress and for that matter, you are no more recognized as a member of the party and cannot carry yourself as such. Now, part of the statement signed by the General Secretary of the party, Asir Nketia, reads, Ms. Anyudoho was tasked to return any party property that may be in his custody and also forfeit any money, dues or subscription fees that he has made to the party. In February 2021, Samuel Kokwa Anyudoho was suspended from the party with immediate effect. John Singh Asidu Nketia, the General Secretary of the party, in a letter said the decision was after the Functional Executive Committee considered two separate petitions from members from members of the party now to help us with some analysis on this matter poster ben singh he is a, the managing direct managing editor of the daily dispatch newspaper he's also the he's also a journalist like all of us join he's joined us briefly for some thoughts good evening sir thank you very much for joining us Hello. Yes, Mr. Benefsen, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us on Newsline on Metro TV. Thank you very much. Can you please raise your voice a bit? That's fine. Um, first of uh, all, I'd like to ask you, did you see this coming? I'm talking about the dismissal of Kokwa Nyidohu. Well, if you look at what had been done uh, concerning uh, Aloto Jacobs and the... Uh, uh, um, and uh, at, at, at Tugiba, 
I, I think that as I saw it come, you know, so I, I wasn't too surprised. I'm not too surprised at all. Right. Would you say that Mr. Kokwan Yudoho is the cause of his own woes? Pardon? Would you say that Koku Anidoho has brought this onto himself, or you smell a rat? Well, I think that unlike maybe Alote and Atubiga, I suspect that Koku Anidoho may decide. I haven't spoken to him yet. He's a different kettle of fish. He may decide to challenge his expulsion from the party in the law courts. I believe that he may just want to do that. How do you suppose, or how do you reckon, um, that this latest action can have some kind of a political electoral impact on the NDC? Do you reckon that? Well, I think that, you know, there have been instances in this country that parliamentary seats have been won by one vote or two votes. But if you look at the harm the party would have gone through, if these dismissals had not been done, like uh, Aloti Jacobs and uh, uh, Kokwa Idoho, I believe that it would have opened the floodgates for people to go for people to go against the party and expect that nothing will happen to them. So yes. Uh, definitely, maybe Koku might not vote for NDC again. His friends or relatives may decide not to vote. But perhaps look at the other side of the coin that it may encourage other people who may decide that, look, we can do anything we want and get away with it. All right, Mr. Badaf Singh, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Newsline on Metro TV. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. Benef Singh is, is a poster, the managing editor of the Daily Dispatch newspaper, talking to us this evening on Newsline on Metro TV. Now, in other news, the Minority Caucus is accusing the first Deputy Speaker and Chairman of Parliament's Privileges Committee, that's Joseph Osewusu, of shielding the embattled Member of Parliament for the Asin Central constituency, Kennedy Japan. Now, Mr. Japan has been referred to the Committee over Contempt and Threats to Love FM's Erasto Sasari Donko. The Member of Parliament for the Saniregu, that's uh, ABE Fuseni, who is also a member of the Privileges Committee, has told Metro News his side of the committee is yet to be invited to a single meeting after they had earlier rejected a proposed Zoom meeting called by Joseph Osewusu to decide on the modalities for the probe. That we are not even there yet. Ever since the committee was constituted, this is the maiden meeting. This is the first meeting the committee is attending to outline its program of work. You know, when a committee is appointed, the committee, the leadership is made up of both uh, uh, the chairman and the ranking member. They are the leader. They constitute what we call the leadership of the committee. Ever since this committee was put together, we have not met. This is the first time we are going to meet. So when the chairman was calling the meeting and indicated that he wanted the meeting done by Zoom, we said, what is the basis for that? He told us that. Yes, and we said that what is the basis for that? That, number one, we think that this is the first meeting of the committee. There are members who don't even know each other. There are members who have not even fraternized. So the best is for members to, to come physically, for us to hold a meeting and, and, and fraternize and do whatever it takes. So we did not see any basis for Zoom meeting. And we were asking what is the basis for the Zoom meeting? That because of COVID-19. And we think that it doesn't make sense. Because the same speak, uh, uh, first deputy speaker who, who advocated a Zoom meeting. He's sitting in, on, on the chair here. We just, after this, just go inside. He's presiding over a meeting of more than 100 members of parliament. So if you cannot meet 20 people, can you meet 100 people? Ah, Master, I'm saying that if because of COVID protocols, you cannot meet 20 people, can you meet 100 people? Over 100 people. So you go and you are holding a meeting with over 100 people and come and tell us that you cannot meet 20 of us. How do you, how do you think of us? What do you make of us? So I have a lot of respect for the, for, for, the, for the first deputy speaker. But on this particular matter, respectfully, he has goofed very badly. And I think that he must come back and do what is right and proper and let the committee meet as a committee. Laji ABF Husseini has also been calling, for, he's been calling on the president, Ekufuado, 
to dismiss the health minister, Kwekwajima Menu, over his decision to bypass parliament and cabinet and signing an agreement for the purchase of the Sputnik V vaccines. Maybe if Sini is wondering why the minister refused to heed to a legal advice by the attorney general not to go ahead and sign the deal. How, can, how did the minister go publicly to indicate that first that he had taken leave of his senses? It, it, it must have